Recently, recently I asked a number of Chinese young people uh, if they would feel safer in their city or living in the country. And amazingly to me, every single one of those kids told me that they would feel safer in the city than they would living out in the country village, a city that is like four times bigger than New York. And, uh, and yet, from their perspective, they feel safer to be there where, you know, food comes easy and when there's police and so forth. Now, I simply don't understand that uh, because, well, for one, I didn't grow up in China, you know. <laughs> I didn't even grow up in the city. And I think probably most of us would feel safer out in the countryside. Um, perhaps, maybe with the exception of those who feel like they need to be closer to a hospital or, or a fire department or, or something like that. Um, but truthfully, honestly, I think the reason we might feel safer, the, I think the reason we feel like at home in the country, well, our countryside just really isn't that rugged, is it? <laughs> You know, you go find somebody who lives out in the country and they've got running water, they've got electricity, they probably even have cell phone coverage for crying out loud. You know, throughout the course of history, going all the way back to the Tower of Babel, I would say 99% of people have preferred to live in the comforts and confines of a city than to venture out into the wilderness. More people would prefer to stay uh, in the hustle and bustle than to go out, venture into the wilderness, forge a trail and live on the frontier. I think, honestly, it's the same with our faith. With faith, most Christians never venture out onto the frontier. Most Christians are uh, more prone to stay uh, uh, going with the flow, staying where it, it is easy, so to speak, rather than to step out into the frontier of, of, of faith. And those people that do, those people that live according to the Bible, those people that live by the faith of Jesus Christ, they look as different from society as John the Baptist did. See, when it is culturally acceptable to get baptized, everyone will. But if you live in a place where it's, it's not with the culture, maybe it's even against the law, well, then to follow Jesus in biblical baptism, suddenly the obedient believer finds himself living on the faith frontier, believing and behaving very differently than everyone else. You've heard it many times throughout your life, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And truly that is what it means to live in the frontier of faith, to take God at his word rather than take man at his word. See, just like a child who prefers to stay in the safety of a city, just like that child who looks on at the village like it's some quaint novelty, the vast majority of people will look at the behavior of those people living by faith as if that's just some quaint thing. And you've heard it before. People look to you and they say something like, you know, religion is just your crutch, right? And they think, well, it's just some little novelty. It's just some little quaint thing, but it really doesn't amount to anything. But I want to notice uh, as we continue through James chapter 5, some truths for those who would live on the frontier of faith. Noticing how the frontiersman of our faith is very noticeably different from everyone else. First of all, living by faith means patiently enduring without retaliating. You'll notice how James puts it for us this morning in chapter number 5, verse 9. He says, Grudge not one against another, brothers, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Now, when you look at that verse and you see the word condemned and the word judge, those words go right together. You could say like, uh, don't, don't act don't hold a grudge against one another lest you be judged by the judge or lest you be condemned by the condemner. It is the judge himself who is expecting you and I who are living by faith to live without holding grudges. So David famously killed Goliath. Probably everybody in this parking lot has heard that before. Following that battle, he was immediately brought to King Saul's courtroom. I mean, he went from the hillsides as a shepherd boy to being one of uh, King Saul's uh, inner men. But as David grew in stature, the king grew in jealousy. So David was left with a question. It's an important question. He found himself in a scenario that he had never imagined out with the sheep. What do you do 
when someone throws a spear at you? I mean, it happened. Here's David minding his own business out with the sheep. Here's David minding his own business, delivering a lunch to his brothers. There's David minding the business of God, just, you know, out killing giants. There's David minding his own business, playing music in the king's courtroom, and all of a sudden a javelin is hurled across the courtroom straight at him. The king himself had thrown a literal, actual spear at David. And what do you do when someone throws a spear at you? It might seem odd that David didn't know the answer to this question. Because according to society, well, David, you just pick up the spear and you throw it right back. You retaliate. David, when somebody throws a spear at you, you just wrench it out of the wall and let them have it. Everyone else does. You can be sure of that. Now, unlike anyone else in all of spear-throwing history, David did not know what to do when a spear was thrown at him. He did not throw Saul's spears back at him, nor did he make spears of his own and wage a war. Something was very different about David. All he did was dodge the spears. Now, what can a man, especially a young man like David, do when, when a king, when your king decides to use you for target practice? What can you do, Christian, in your life when somebody, a co-worker, when somebody in your family, when somebody in your neighborhood decides to start launching spears in your direction? God places people in your life just like God had placed Saul in David's life. You understand that? God placed the spear-throwing king in David's life. And David lived out the rest of his decades understanding fully the ordination of God. He understood fully that the wicked, mad tyrant across the room had been placed there by God. And David understood that he had been placed in the same situation by God. And, and friends, bank on this. God's going to place you somewhere and people will throw spears. You have to recall, you have to remember, you have to walk in the truth that God has placed them there in your life. God has placed you there in their life. Is it unjust? Totally. Guys, injustice is going to continue to happen. It happened against our Christ Jesus. Why wouldn't it happen against us? It happened against David, who was better than all of us. Why wouldn't it happen to you and me? David never got hit. And gradually, I think David learned a very well-kept secret that preserved him through a lot of years. He discovered, I think, three things that prevented him from ever being hit. One, David, check it out, never learned the art of spear throwing. At no point would David ever decide to stoop down to the level of jealousy and rage that the king exhibited. Never would he become a spear thrower. Secondly, I believe David stayed out of the company of spear throwers. And not just on this day with Saul, but yes, David ran away. David got himself up out of the king's presence. And later on, when other spear throwers would come into David's company, whether they were above him or below him, David would not keep company with spear throwers. And thirdly, David kept his mouth shut. In this way, friends, spears will never touch you. Uh, living by the faith of God, living with what we call, what the Bible calls the armor of God will keep you impervious and invulnerable to the spears that foolish men will hurl your way. David never got hit. Friends, you might get struck time and time again by the fiery darts of the wicked. You might get struck by the darts and the spears thrown to you by those in your life. But I can tell you, friends, with the armor of God and with, with, the, with the heart of faith, you can prevent yourself from truly being hit, from truly being pierced. But this behavior is not of the world, you see. This kind of behavior that we're talking about, for David, it, it literally brought him to an actual real wilderness. It, it brought him literally into the frontier to escape Saul. And for you to walk by faith and to not retaliate as is common to man's nature, you will find yourself on the frontier of faith. You'll find yourself behaving very differently than everyone else will tell you to behave. 
This is not the behavior of the world. In fact, our world is proud of their spear throwing. The best spear throwers in our culture are made team captain. And because it's now acceptable and fashionable even to berate and mock your opponent, this idea is actually carrying itself into our homes and into our relationships. The way that, the way that figures are behaving themselves on a platform is not the way the child of God is to behave within their relationships. Politically charged insults permeate the roadways and the airways of our culture. And without even knowing a person, check this out, with knowing nothing, but maybe in a, a party affiliation, Americans are instantly creating and instantly holding grudges. You pull into the parking lot of your favorite restaurant and you see a car over here with a bumper sticker that you don't like and immediately you've got a grudge against that person. This is where we exist as a culture. And friends, if we have to step away from that because that behavior is not of Christ. You are to not grudge one another. And so when the culture of the city, of the populace, of the metropolis of sin is that we grudge one another over anything... Friends, you and I are taught to not grudge one another. So what does that do? That places you out in the frontier looking as weird as John the Baptist. Yes, I am totally aware that it feels, get it, feels like our opponents are hurling spears. And yet, <laughs> when King Saul actually threw a spear at David, the boy dodged and he remained loyal to the person that God had placed into his life. And this is what James 5 is referencing, all right? He says, brothers, don't, don't hold a grudge against one another. For one, you're going to be condemned by the judge. You'll be guilty of God Almighty if you go about making grudges and holding grudges. Secondly, he says in verse number 10, secondly, just take for example the prophets, like literally all of them. Every one of them were, were rejected by their own countrymen. Look, follow me on this. Jewish prophets went to Jewish audiences, except for a couple of them, like Jonah who went to Nineveh. Those prophets that came to their own people were rejected by their own people, by their own kinsmen. They were killed. And Jesus Christ was himself. So James says, oh, look, just take them for example. They did not retaliate. They stayed faithful to the word of God. That's what James is talking about. Each and every Old Testament prophet was rejected by his own countrymen. Jesus taught this to us. Jesus says that the, that the Judaizers had gone about killing God's prophets. They killed even the Son of God. And in this verse, number 10, it says, take them for an example, verse 11, because we count them happy. In other words, blessed. We count them blessed, which endured. See, uh, the story of somebody who is, who is oppressed or persecuted is not that great of a story when they succumb to the trial. But when that prophet of God goes out and withstands the oppression, when he stands faithful on the word of God, you and I count that as blessed. Like, we don't look at Samson and think that was a blessed prophet. That guy failed time and time and time again. But when we look to somebody like Jeremiah who stood, who continued to be faithful to God, who continued to love people, who never held a grudge, then we said, wow, that is a blessed prophet. And so there's blessing in that. We're to look to those as our example. Listen, friends, bank on it. Injustice will continue to happen. The spears will continue to be launched your way. But you cannot, you cannot ever hold grudges. Mark this down, friends. If you, and you got to search your heart on this. I mean, you have to get alone with the Holy Spirit. Lord, reveal in me, reveal in me. Is there a grudge within my heart? Uh, the word grudge here, according to the definition, is sort of like moaning or sighing. Like when somebody walks in the room or when somebody mentions somebody's name and you're like, oh, that guy. Oh, yeah, Josh. Uh, uh, that uh, leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. Look, you got to pray for that. you got to search for that. And if that's the case, if you are not right with men, you are not right with God. You cannot hold a grudge. Not if you're walking by faith. 
Spears will continue to fly your way. You cannot throw them back. Because God is the judge and because he is at hand. And secondly, because spear throwing, spear throwing only co- accomplishes destruction. Nobody ever threw spears to like build a city. It's never for construction. It's only for destruction. And, 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 uh, and in case you're writing me off as a pacifist or something, I want you to listen to Jesus himself, all right? Because James isn't making this up. He's actually a lot of times referencing Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So in Matthew 5, Jesus says, You've heard it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever compels you to go with him a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asks of thee. And from him that would borrow of you, don't turn away. Jesus is the perfect example of somebody standing for God's truth, who speaks the teachings of God, and who suffers for it without retaliation. The Bible tells us that he went to the slaughter without opening his mouth. Jesus Christ never retaliated. He said again in Matthew 5, he says, blessed are ye. Hey, that's that same word. Remember that? He says uh, in James, he says, consider the prophets. They were blessed. Matthew chapter 5, you are blessed with the same blessing. When men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, (laughs) not because you're a jerk, but because you're standing for Jesus. Rejoice and be, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ah, it's the same message. Jesus said, check out the prophets. They suffered. They were blessed. You do the same thing, you'll be blessed. So at this point, you're going to have to either decide. When the spear is lobbed at your face, you now have the choice to grab the spear and throw it back. Or to take Jesus at his word and seek a blessing. Seek a blessing. When the spears are thrown, never, ever retaliate. And in fact, pray that God gives you the strength, the armor of the spirit, to be unscathed even when those spears hit. Living by faith means patiently enduring without retaliating. I also note in verse 11 that living by faith uh, means expecting a merciful outcome from God. See, we're not just leaving this story with like, all right, never throw spears. Uh, behave yourself, kids. Go to the playground. Don't get in a fight. Now, th- there's like a blessing to look forward to here. Look at verse 11. He says, we, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and you've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Wow. So the author, James, he says, don't you remember the story of Job? Job suffered a lot, a lot. But in that story, we find that the end of the story, God is both pitiful and merciful towards Job. God is full of pity. God is full of mercy towards his man, Job. Pity, now check this out. Pity is expressing God's heart. God's heart looked on to Job with pity. And his actions towards Job were mercy. So in his heart, God is merciful towards you in your suffering. Don't don't think that when somebody lobs the spirit at you, God doesn't see that. Look, verse 9 just told us the judge is at hand. The judge, like, this is two kids in a room throwing spears at each other, and like, dad's right there. He knows. Okay? And if your brother lobs the spirit at you, and your dad's in the same room, you don't throw it back. You just kind of look to dad, and you wait for punishment to happen, right? Yeah, amen. That's the best. Let's just get dad in on this, right? And that's the whole concept. He's like, God is watching. And God is watching his children with a heart of pity. And so when he looks on at you, when when those are throwing spears at you, when those are oppressing you, when those are persecuting you, Christ said, the Lord is looking on and his heart towards you is pitiful. You say, well, is God going to deliver me from that spear right then and there? Well, that's entirely up to God. I cannot answer that because I am not the Lord. I don't have God's plans all laid out. Maybe it's beneficial that a a spear comes your way today or not. I have no idea. I do know this. All things do work together for good 
to those that love God and to those that are called according to his purpose. And I know here that the Bible is telling me in James 5, verse 11, that the end of everything is the Lord and the Lord is pitiful and the Lord is merciful to his people. So his heart towards you is pity and his actions towards you are mercy. I want you to remember something. 1 Corinthians 10, it tells us, God is faithful. No spear in human history has ever escaped the eyes of God. God is faithful. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tested above what you're able. But he will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So here's the catch. You might feel like you're being crushed, but you haven't been. Uh, You might feel like the burden is too much, but I mean, you're here. You're still breathing. You're still putting one foot in front of the other. You're not done yet. God has sustained you this far. God is not allowing anything above what you are able. You know, the analogy I would like to use right here is from weightlifting. Because, you know, the weight does feel heavier by the second. But all that means is that you haven't collapsed yet. (laughs) If you're still bearing the weight, it means it's still on you and that you are getting stronger. Now, you can pray according to God's pity. You can understand when, when, when those burdens are heavy. You can understand when those spears are sharp. You can understand that God's heart is full of pity. And you can pray according to that pity. And you can pray according to God's mercy. In fact, my friends, I want you to take inventory of your prayers. I want you to ask introspectively, looking within yourself, have you prayed according to the pity and according to the mercy of God? Jesus gave a really excellent example of this. He talked about two men who were praying in the Jewish temple. One was a religious leader. He stood up in so much pride, and he began to pray things like, God, I'm so thankful you never made me like that wicked sinner. Oh, Lord. And he began to pray really to himself and for himself. The other guy there in the temple was a tax collector, a a publican, known for cheating and stealing. The Bible says that publican standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes unto heaven, but he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Have you asked God for that mercy? I wonder, have you asked God to be merciful unto you? One man in the temple prayed according to tradition. He prayed so that God would reward him. All right, in other words, he was praying so that God would owe him something. And that's how most people pray. You know, they're taught just to like recite something and they think they're just appeasing the creator. Yet the other man said, uh, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And Jesus said it was that man who went home forgiven. Indeed, to be born again, to be a child of God, To be a saved member of heaven's family, you absolutely must have prayed according to God's mercy. It is by his mercies that we are not consumed. It's not because you're so cool to be in church this morning that we're not consumed. It's not because you dropped some cash in the offering plate that we're not consumed. You're not consumed because of his mercies. Friends, absolutely, we must come to him asking for mercy. Romans chapter 10, it says it this way. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and if you believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, the day that you come to God in faith and in humility, begging for his mercy, as we already read it this morning from Ephesians, well, God is rich in mercy. He is wealthy in mercy. God is rolling in mercy. And he has it stored up for anyone who would simply ask. Yeah, we have sinned against our maker. We have sinned against our life giver. And yet Jesus, our maker, he came to earth, born of a virgin. He lived without sin. He died upon the cross in order to give us full and free salvation. And the mercy, check it out, the mercy, the mercy of Jesus Christ is your only hope for forgiveness and salvation. 
In the story of the two men praying in the temple, which one are you? Are you praying according to religion? Are you praying according to tradition? Or are you really, have you called out to God? Are you pleading for mercy? God is rich in mercy. Ephesians 2, 4. It's there on your bulletin right at the very top. Ephesians 2, 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, God is rich in mercy and he gives it to those who would ask in humility and in faith. So, I mean, this is such a great, powerful principle from James 5. He says, consider Job. Job was this awful story of suffering with a merciful ending. He suffered much, but God blessed him. God preserved him. And, and here's the thing, while Job felt, check it, remember, we're just, we're com- we keep coming back to this idea of feelings. When he felt completely destroyed, well, you know, God actually never allowed Job to bear anything more than he was able. God is faithful. He will not let you bear more than you're able. So if you're, if you're still standing in the battle and if you're still sailing into the storm, you are a testimony to that. For those in the faith family of God, you have not been crushed and you never will be. The end of your story, child of God, is a merciful outcome. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And if you, if you pause long enough to think about it, you realize what it means to feel the need for mercy. Like when things are out of your hand and we should, when you start like negotiating with, oh Lord, get me out of this situation. I'll never return to that sin ever again. All of a sudden we're crying, like we don't have any other option but to cry. You know what that is? That's a, that's a feeling that I need mercy. That is a sense that I need it. Well, call on God. Call on him. He's wealthy. He is rich in mercy. Living by faith means expecting a merciful outcome from God. And finally, living by faith, you'll notice it here in verse 12, living by faith... <coughs> means living with integrity. Verse number 12, it says, above all things. This is so interesting. James, is a, man, this book has some <laughs> heavy stuff. I mean, the conviction from this book is thick. He tells us all sorts of ways of, of following after Christ and living out there on that frontier of faith and living differently than the world. But then he says that He says, above all things. That ought to get our attention, right? Above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any oath, but let your yea be yea, and let your ye- your nay, nay, lest you fall into condemnation. There's that word again that has to do with the judge who is at hand. God is watching, so be true to your word. God is watching, the judge is near, so live with integrity. And once again, I think James is actually referencing back to the Sermon on the Mount. Like, we keep coming back here because it's the best sermon ever. Jesus said, again, you've you've heard it was said of old, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. I say unto you, swear, this is Jesus, all right? Jesus Christ, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Now, there was a point in history, there was this common saying, it is the word of an Englishman. And then, like, over time, that, that, that changed into, it's the word of a gentleman, right? And so the gentleman was known, his word is his bond. A gentleman is only as good as his word, and to live otherwise would to be a charlatan. And Dr. David Livingston, the medical missionary in Africa, He would often write in his diary how his mind and his thoughts and his heart were brought back to his favorite scripture. Matthew 28, 20. The words of Christ. Jesus who said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And David would record in his journal that this is the word of the 
of a gentleman of the strictest and most sacred honor. See, Jesus has given you his word that he will be with you. Jesus has given you his word that when the spears are lobbed your way and when you do not retaliate, when you do not revile, when you are reviled and revile not again, Jesus says there is blessing upon you. He is with you. Your end is to be an expected outcome of mercy. And that, friends, is the word of a gentleman. The word of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's an end of it. See, the danger in swearing and the reason that we're taught by Jesus, we're taught by the Old Testament, and we're taught by James, do not swear, is because, well, we're not all powerful This is super basic, but like, I'm not always able to keep my word. If I went around to everyone like making promises and making vows and making oaths, look, I I can't keep everything that I I would ever commit myself to. I mean, what was it? Like three weeks ago, we're like, we're going to have church. And then the rain is pouring down, you know, and we're out of here fleeing for the indoors. I can't always keep my word. And so we have to be so cautious when God told Abraham his covenant, God said, check it out, surely I will bless thee. Surely, assuredly. And honestly, I don't suppose I can do everything or maybe anything assuredly. I can do my best. And the Bible is certainly not teaching us to to never behave assuredly. Like that ought to be the goal. In fact, last week, really great example of this. We sold a car. And when one fellow stopped by to buy it, like he agreed to a price, we shook on it. He says, all right, I'm going to go to the bank. And I, in that moment, like shaking on a deal, I felt, I mean, just intensely committed to what we agreed on. Like, I, you know, come what may, I'm going to honor the agreement that I just shook on. And uh, lo and behold, that guy never showed up again. He broke my trust. The principle is to not make an extreme vow. Uh, <laughs> did I say vowel? Vow. Do not make an extreme vow. Well, I'm having trouble saying that. A-E-I-O-U, not vowel. <laughs> ah, don't make a promise. <laughs> okay. Don't make an oath that you, that you can only live up to like if you're God. The most obvious vow we make is the marriage vow, and we commit to a lifetime of marriage. Now, I, don't, I never committed to a perfect marriage. I, I couldn't possibly make a vow to her that like, I would never wrong her, that I'm going to be the perfect husband ever. Okay? I can't make that, but I mean, I can remain in my vow to be her husband for a lifetime till death do us part. I, I should remain to that. And before God, before the judge, I better remain faithful to that vow. The book of Ecclesiastes says, When you vow a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. See what that is? God looks on a vow breaker. God looks on a promise breaker as a fool. God has no pleasure in fools. Pay that which you have vowed. Check this. Better is it that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Man, let your word be your bond. A vow is a solemn commitment. And how many of you guys, you know that the people in life that are out there making the strongest promises, the people who flippantly say, well, I swear to God this really happened, or I swear to heaven, or or whatever, those are the people that really truly seem to be the most untrustworthy, aren't they? See, God takes no pleasure in fools. And it is that fool that does not live by his word that has to go around making such extreme promises where Jesus says, no, you don't swear by God. God swears by himself. You don't swear anything. You let your yes be yes and your no be no. Live by integrity. The integrity of a Christian says, my word is my bond. Living by faith means living by integrity. So then we have to ask, like, well, come on. Who has perfectly maintained integrity? Like, is there anybody in this parking lot today who has never broken a promise? Is there anyone here today who has never broken their integrity? 
That's why it is so important for us to remember that God is rich in pity and God is rich in mercy. Because I have broken integrity. Because I have broken my word. Because I've lied. Because I have failed. Because I have sinned. Because I have uh, transgressed against the Lord. I need a Savior who is rich in mercy. So get with God. Confess your need to be saved from sin. Confess your need to be born again. Beg for mercy, and the God who is rich in it will give it to you. However, the alternative is wrath. Jesus taught this in, in John 3, 36. Jesus said, He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of of God abides on him. You get it? There's two choices that you have today. You can go with the mercy of God or you can go with the wrath of God. I think that's like the easiest choice ever. And yet our human pride often gets in the way. We start, we start trying to, I don't know, reconcile my own sin. Start trying to justify myself. Well, yeah, I've broken a few little promises here or there, but come on, that, that's not deserving of hell. Oh, see, the, 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 the topic at hand is whether or not you have faith enough in Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Because he who does not believe in the Son of God, that's who receives the wrath of God. Yeah, we've all sinned. Duh. We've all sinned. The, the difference is there are a number of people in this parking lot who have Jesus Christ as Savior, and there's a number of people today who do not have Jesus Christ as Savior. And that right there determines whether you are under the mercy of God or you are under the wrath of God. Have you called on him to save you? Is Jesus your very own personal savior? If not, dear friend, call on him for mercy. What are you waiting for? Call on him for mercy. If you have, friends, if you have, if you've been born again, if you're a child of God, if, you've, if you're in his family, are you living in the frontier of faith? Does your life stand out from those who are hiding safely away in the world's protection? It's a false safety. See, living by faith means patiently enduring without retaliating. It means living with integrity. But when we fail in those regards, remember, living by faith means expecting a merciful outcome for the child of God. Would you pray with me? Almighty Heavenly Father, I call unto you now because of, because of your mercy and because of your pity, Lord. It, it is such a great joy to open the Word of God and really to be guided by the, by the light of the Spirit, to, to look at these words that just leap right off the page that speak to our hearts. And Lord, that is amazing. And I pray, Lord, that um, this congregation today would respond to what they've heard. I pray that we would not be just hearers only, but that we would be doers of the word. That we would be obedient to you. And I pray, dear God, for those today that have been pricked by your Holy Spirit in their heart, for those that have heard from God, I pray that they would respond in obedience today. Please reveal to us, Lord, where we need to make things right with you. Please reveal to us the grudges. Uh, reveal to us uh, those, those things that, that fall short of the glory of God revealed to us our need for salvation and for a Savior. Precious Lord, if there is somebody today who has never been saved, Lord, if there's somebody who today needs a Savior, I pray, God, that you would make that perfectly clear to their heart and would they re respond, Lord, in faith, understanding that you are rich in pity and you are rich in mercy. Lord, I love you and I thank you for the joy it is to know you and to understand that all of my sins were carried away by Jesus Christ. Lord, you have, you have brought my soul to life. Lord, you have prepared a home in heaven for me. And I praise you and I rejoice in that. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ today. Would you anoint them by the fruit of the Spirit, the, the, the anointing of the Spirit? Would they bear the fruit? I pray for love and for joy and for peace upon this congregation, helping us to understand, Lord, that... When the spears are thrown, there is a blessing in Jesus Christ for remaining humble. Teach us that, O oh Father, I pray in Jesus' almighty name.